Hi, this is DeSalini, and welcome to episode 14 of 90s Overlooked and a Hood. How's it going? We're going to get straight into the album today, and that album is The Lurid Traversal of Route 7 by Hoover. Uh, released on Discord Records in February of 1994. So Hoover were a post-hardcore band from the Washington DC area um, who formed in 1992. Um, this is their only real full-length album and they split shortly after um, the album was released in 1994. They did convene, reconvene, uh, in 1997 to do one last recording of some songs that they never really got round to uh, releasing or recording. Um, and that was released on the Slow Dime label. But this is their only full-length album. And uh, as post-hardcore records come, uh, I think it's a pretty definitive statement. But before I start talking about post-hardcore, which I have mentioned several times, I think, on a few previous episodes. Um, just to put it in context, I'm going to talk a little about hardcore. So, <laughs> hardcore is essentially the American take on punk. It's basically punk music, but faster, more aggressive, harder, louder, very highly stylized. So hardcore was pretty much a reaction in the US to the kind of the, the softer way that music was going in their eyes um, in terms of punk kind of morphing into new wave music. Um, hardcore was seen as kind of staying punk, staying true to the kind of DIY punk ethos. And um, I think it was also a bit of a reaction to the political kind of state of play at the turn of the 80s. Um, this was the decade of republicanism, conservatism, uh, Reaganomics, Margaret Thatcher. And um, there's a lot of highly politicised content in the lyrics of hardcore bands. Um, Yet yeah, these scenes, the hardcore scenes, all kind of tended to spring up around major cities. So in places like LA, you would have Black Flag, the Minutemen, uh, San Francisco, home to the Dead Kennedys and Flipper. Uh, Chicago was the home to bands like The Digits and Naked Reagan. Uh, Texas had the big boys. Uh, but Washington DC was a particularly kind of uh, big scene, um, home to bands such as Minor Threat, uh, Bad Brains, um, bands like Government Issue and Scream. And um, post-hardcore essentially, I think, came about, or you can trace its beginnings, to uh, what was or became known as the Revolution Summer of 1985. Um, a bunch of bands had been getting increasingly kind of weary of certain elements of the scene, um, the kind of the violence, the slam dancing, moshing, uh, which tended to lead to kind of like a macho, sexist, misogynist kind of feel to the whole scene. And um, a bunch of bands didn't really like the way it was going and wanted to kind of reframe hardcore in some ways, um, allow people more space to kind of express themselves more, be a bit more thoughtful. Um, you know, don't shackle yourself down to this kind of style, this fast, hard, violent style. And just to allow a bit more openness and creativity to creep into the music. Um, um, and you saw this all over, not just in DC. Um, I've already talked about bands like uh, uh, Husker Du uh, discovering more melodic side uh, to their music. Uh, the Minutemen, um, um, Big Black in Chicago. Um, they were all doing something different outside of what was what had become quite a kind of straitjacket. And I. Uh, I think what happened with the DC scene is that a lot of the bands that decided to get on board with this kind of change of direction ultimately became classified as 
well, initially post-hardcore, but also rather more contentiously for certain of the bands. This was the origin of the term emo or emo call. And a lot of the bands didn't like this. And, and I can see why, because essentially they're saying, you know, you can't be singing about emotional subjects. And if you do, then we have to brand you a certain way. I think by definition, all music is going to touch on human emotions. It has to. It's uh, it's an expression of creativity and feeling. So bands like Rites of Spring and Embrace uh, and ultimately Fugazi um, really weren't that keen on this label. And neither am I really. So I think post-hardcore covers things quite well enough. Um, so Hoover, the band we're talking about today, one of the early 90s um, kind of group of post-hardcore bands coming out of the Washington, D.C. scene. Hoover was um, Alex Dunham on guitar, uh, Fred Erskine on bass, Chris Farrell on drums, and Joe McRedmond on second guitar. Um, three of the members uh, also shared vocal duties, which was quite a common thing amongst some hardcore bands. Um, the whole concept of having, you know, dueling vocalists or vocalists who would take different songs on uh, was pretty commonplace. Um, as I said, Hoover only really lasted in their original form uh, for a couple of years, but they did subsequently go on rather all the members of Hoover went on to play roles in numerous great kind of post-hardcore bands or bands that were doing kind of noise rock or post-rock or math rock, all of these kind of genres. Um, I could reel a few off. Things like Regulator Watts, The Crown Hate Ruin, June of 44, The Boom, um, Sea Tiger. Um, and each of those bands bore some of the sonic imprint that you hear in this record. I think it's a great record in terms of the individual players all contributing something, and you can hear those contributions. But my goodness, when you roll them all up into one, it just creates this strange kind of machine, this, this really organic experience. Um, Hoover were a band who you knew would rehearse long and hard, but a lot of that material would just come out of watching each other across the, the rehearsal room, and giving each other nods, and just kind of having this semi-improvisational style of creating their music. You hear it in everything on this album. And, um, and I think that's where they kind of stand out in this post-hardcore scene. They were kind of bringing a kind of a looser, jazzier, dubbier element to the sound than we'd heard from other bands doing this kind of music. Yes, they do owe, owe a debt to, you know, a scene mainstay like Fugazi, who were a huge influence. But I think it took even Fugazi, it took them longer to, to kind of allow this much variation and subtlety and looseness into their music. So the album, The Lurid Traversal of Route 7. Yeah, one listen and you will understand how this could only really have come out of the DC post-hardcore scene. But like I say, these elements that they were introducing were, I think, quite unique. Um, the dubbier side of things. I think other bands had kind of used kind of, you know, dub bass lines uh, in their music, but the music of Hoover sounds like a band trying to recreate what is essentially a studio technique. The dub music is born out of kind of studio manipulation, but this is a band recreating that in a live environment and using it as part of their songwriting. So very, very big on dynamics uh, and occasionally extending the songs beyond what you would probably expect from hardcore or post-hardcore songs. Different instruments taking the lead sometimes and dropping out very textural um the rhythm section being a real cornerstone of the sound pinning things down like a like a kind of a bass coat for the guitars to kind of be applied on top of um but at the same time you can still hear that hardcore uh grounding in the in the in the vocals in the guitar playing when it gets aggressive but always kind of controlled 
and the fact that you, you hear very little in the way of kind of effects, you know. Um, a lot of hardcore bands were very um, focused on getting their dynamics and their sound across by just having an amp that was cranked and just controlling the amount of distortion or overdrive they were getting just through their playing dynamics, just through playing softly or harder, digging in more. Uh, it's an unmistakable sound when you hear a band making music this way. And uh, yeah, Hoover were masters at it. Some key tracks then. So the opener, Distant, um, it begins with this kind of thick, rustling blanket of guitar feedback, which gives way to this kind of aggressive, jagged, uh, rhythmic intro with these kind of stabbing, punctuated, syncopated guitar riffs. Um, but the guitar style kind of drops out at one point and it gets replaced by just this kind of more expressionistic kind of looser feedback um, and just kind of quite spare harmonics while the bass and the drums lock into this kind of groove. But the vocals, when the vocals are there, you know it, you're listening to something that's come out of hardcore music, the screamed, urgent style, you know, singing. It's only 3,000 miles. And the song kind of seesaws back and forth between these two, these two kind of modes. But this kind of urgency and the f frenetic feel of it and the tension never really lets up. Um, yeah, it's a cracking opener, it really is. The track Electrolux is the one that most clearly illustrates everything that Hoover were about. Um, it's seven minutes long, so it's slightly extended compared to some of the other songs on the album. And it opens in kind of full dub mode with this repetitive kind of circling deep bass line, um, working around this kind of choppy, like ticking uh, drum pattern. A simple kind of guitar riff gets introduced, but then it, it kind of drops out to let in these kind of almost whispered, you know, very soft vocals, which sets this kind of mood. And they're very abstract. Um, there's very little kind of meaning. It, it, you get the feeling that the lyrics are there to kind of, again, add as much texture as the guitars were. You get a feeling from it. Leave it alone, they say. You know, carry your own. But then at a point, the guitars just kind of land into this kind of buzzing, stabbing kind of morass which takes the song up a level. And they introduce a trumpet. Fred Erskine, the bass player, could also play the trumpet. And they, they introduce this really unexpected kind of uh, trumpet line um, with this kind of very simple but kind of quite threatening little melody with vocals getting harder and hoarser and more desperate through the song. And then the dub tricks kick in again and they bring it down. The noise retreats. You get this gradually repeating cycling bass riff returning again with just the guitars layering this kind of mesh of feedback over everything and at this point yeah it kind of the song loosens up even more the bass seems to get kind of oily and slicky and slippery it kind of it kind of leans into the song a lot more and um yeah yeah this is a pretty definitive song i think if you were trying to look at you know post-hardcore sounds of the early 90s. Um, yeah, it's an amazing song. The album kind of kind of winds down to a kind of a quite a subdued instrumental track called Route 7, which is kind of like the it's the calm at the eye of the storm, if you like. It's it's the serene point of the album. And as I say, just this instrumental, very gentle song with the sound of crickets through the back of it. But from here on, the album kind of starts to crank up, cranks up the feeling of tension and intensity. A track like Father has got this almost kind of Morse code drum patterns dropping in and out of this pulsing bass line, a very complex kind of sound. And these hoarse vocals are introduced and just on top of this with these jagged little single note guitars. Um, they feel like bits that are dropping in from all over. They just kind of gel into this ruffled kind of uneasy rhythm, um, which they sustain through the song. It's got this edge of the seat feel throughout the whole thing. And it's only towards the end that they, they kind of, they turn the guitars up again. They dig in for this kind of scouring, ringing guitar finale. 
um, and this kind of light and shade dynamic thing happens through the, the next two songs, through Cable, through Letter. And then we get to the last song on the album, Cuts Like Drugs, which kind of rises out of this like fog of um, hissing ride cymbal and this kind of slightly lazy snare. And it has this kind of rolling feeling with some kind of guitar feedback laid over the top. And this little riff picked out on the other guitar with this simple loping downcast riff. It sounds kind of quite loose. And it so cycles through this same structure. The vocals being added, getting getting hoarser and more strained with each verse. They sing, I know you're tired, don't sleep, don't sleep. And as it kind of progresses, the drums, they start to snap harder. This loose feeling disappears and the guitars, they kind of loom higher. They mesh together into this. It's like a glowering kind of cloud of feedback that's just hovering over the rhythm section and what they're doing. And finally, um, this kind of cycling stops and the rhythm switches into a different kind of an offbeat signature and they introduce this huge epic melody towards the end and they start singing the payoff line of the song, cuts like drugs, somehow satisfy. It just gets to this rasping kind of breathless finale. It's a fantastic song. And um, if it proves one thing, it shows that they really knew how to structure an album uh, from the opener through the kind of this dramatic Electrolux track on side one down to this kind of serene, kind of calm place at Route 7 and then gradually climbing up towards the end of the album to end with cuts like drugs. They really, really knew how to sequence a record to ring ring the, the most out of it emotionally. Um, yeah, it really does feel like a journey. Um, it's a fantastic record. So here we are again. Um, usual suggestions. Do what you will. Um, but it would be very nice if you would come back and join me soon for another episode of 90s Overlooked and Heard. Bye for now.